Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of The Legal Anchor. Today we'll be talking about maritime law and how international maritime law has been shaped in Jamaica and the world. What is law is the first question you now need to be asking yourselves. I want you to pause the video and now think what is law? So, law is a series of rules and regulations and they are imposed upon people with sanctions. Apart from that now, we now need to look at what is maritime law. Maritime law is a branch of international law. International law is a group, is laws put together by custom or treaty that are legally binding on a people. That carries us to what is international maritime law. International maritime law has to do with how maritime affairs are governed in general. So now that we have a clear understanding of maritime law, the definition, we now need to look at how it has developed through the years to where we are today culminating with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, of 1982. We are here in downtown Kingston. What is downtown Kingston to international maritime law? Downtown Kingston is the epicenter of maritime law. Across here, we have the Jamaica Conference Center. Now, the Jamaica Conference Center as many of you know, is where a lot of our major seminars are held. And in more recently with COVID, we've been having parliament there. But many of you do not know that the inter that the maritime that this convention center was built because of maritime law. The International Seabed Authority, located just next door to the Jamaica Conference Center, is where maritime law originated, you can almost say. Maritime law, as a result, we can see how it has molded our country. The, the International Seabed Authority came about as a result of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. To understand how we got there, we need to now backtrack in history and look at from Christopher Columbus all the way to today to understand how we got our maritime laws. Go. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was signed in Montego Bay, Jamaica in 1982. The significance of signing of this treaty is how we have this building here today, International Seabed Authority. To understand the workings of the Seabed Authority, we now need to go back in time to now understand where Jamaica stood and also why the International Seabed Authority is here and also the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was not the first maritime treaty that we had. Prior to that, the very, one of the first treaties that we can see was the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas had to do with the line of demarcation. I don't know how many of you remember it from when you were in high school, but this was the line that divided the world. Spain and Portugal had come to the consensus that the world was to be divided in half. And they claimed one part of the world and the other part was claimed by Portugal. What we saw as a result of that was, as you can imagine, disputes. Countries did not agree with this treaty, and as such, many countries disregarded it. There were many writings for and against it. These writings came to be known as the Battle of the Books. This Battle of the Books ended up in countries just totally disregarding this Treaty of Tordesillas. From the Treaty of Tordesillas, we then began to see the emergence of a new way of persons trying to demark the, proper, the lines for where their country's borders would end, their maritime borders. 
So what happened was they now began to use a cannon. How far can a cannon shoot? And that is what they used to decide whether how far their territorial landmass was for the sea. When you look at that, at the time the technology was three nautical miles. So three nautical miles was the territorial sea. So that went on for a few years, but then many countries did not know if they agreed with it. Some countries didn't, some countries did. The United States was quite vocal. President Harry Truman, in his famous Truman Proclamation, stated that America was not going to adhere to this, and America claimed that it would have been 200 nautical miles, claiming the natural promulgation of the land. That was what they're saying is, my country is not just sit on a piece of land. The country is also the water, because as you can imagine, a country is held up by its superstructure. And that superstructure, they're saying, extends 200 nautical miles. So as such, we see that America, from as far back as around 1964, claimed that their landmass was now 200 nautical miles. Some countries agreed, some disagreed. But what we do know was that this was the first meeting that they had, the United Nations Convention, then had a first meeting to discuss how were we going to demark the land, the waters around the landmass. As a result of that, as a result of that, we then saw the more development of the maritime industry and how we were going to demarcate this landmass. They had a series of meetings the United Nations was formed in 1930s. They had a whole series of meetings of how should they now do this. Various meetings came and went and eventually it was agreed not until 1982 was the final document ready for signing the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. This convention dealt with almost every aspect of maritime. It dealt with archipelagos, which is what Jamaica is, a group of islands. It also dealt with, apart from the archipelagos, it also dealt with many other things, such as marine pollution. It dealt with the seabed. Same building we're looking at here, the seabed is one of the parts in the ocean that is deep in the ocean and what it is, it is the floor of the ocean. Now, the view was that there are very precious magnetic nodules down there, which are still there to this day. Those magnetic nodules can be used to make batteries, copper, coins, and in more modern times we found that they can be used to make cell phones. The international community at the time was of the view that these precious stones and um, minerals would be exploited by the international, by large countries if the international community did not come together and ensure that this area of the sea was protected. So they, in drafting of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, they ensured that the International Seabed Authority would also be something that is established to ensure that would be established to ensure that the seabed is well looked after and Jamaica won as to where it should be placed. The seat of the international seabed is right here in downtown Kingston, making Jamaica a maritime capital of the world. So I am not lying when I say we are in the center of the maritime industry. It's located in downtown Kingston. So, we have the International Seabed Authority located there. We also have the Maritime Authority of Jamaica, which ensures how our laws are written. That is located in downtown Kingston. We also have located down here in downtown, the port, just further down the road. We have many freight forwarding companies located down here. We have law firms located down here, such as maritime law firms that deal with maritime law and other things to do with the maritime industry. Okay, rolling whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready. 
So far, you have learned about the history of maritime law. Now, where do you go when you have a maritime dispute? The international community has established the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, ITLAS. There at ITLAS, that's where maritime disputes are adjudicated. However, if somebody should um, dispute their jurisdiction, they can also go to the International Court of Justice based in The Hague, Netherlands. Here in Jamaica, if you have a maritime dispute, you would have to go to the Supreme Court of Jamaica. Under Section 18 of the Supreme Court Act of Jamaica, it states that all maritime matters must be brought there and bailiffs and necessary persons are empowered to act under these laws. As such, we see that Jamaica has very robust laws as it relates to our maritime space. We have the Beach Areas Act, we have the Fisheries Act, we have the Harbors Act, we have the Port Act, we have the Pilotage Act, we have the Watershed Act, we have the EEZ Act, that's the Exclusive Economic Zone, we have the Maritime Areas Act, which is the most important act, maritime act in Jamaica. Why is it the most important maritime act, you may ask? Because it is a reflection of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. And that, my friends, I'm telling you, is how Jamaica's maritime laws have been developed. And a citizen who has a problem needs to bring it to the Supreme Court of Jamaica. that you have had with the ship, shipping the uh, oh, okay. items on the shipper. Yeah. Oh, is it, sorry, is it the bill of laden that, that would it be in that? The bill of laden may have it, as well as whatever documents that you may also have a contract that they may have to ship the items. Right. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Okay. Another question. What legislation allows maritime disputes to resolve in Jamaica? The, Ju the Ju Supreme Court of Judy Catcher Act allows for that. Okay. That is a co the law that upholds the Supreme Court of Jamaica. Okay. So that is where it is found and in that legislation you will find a section that states that all maritime disputes are to commence in the Supreme Court of Jamaica. Oh, okay, not in any of the courts? No, Supreme Court is where they commence. I see, wow, okay. Um, Three. Well, we just spoke about this slightly. It says, is the Supreme Court the only court to resolve maritime disputes? Yes. Okay. The Supreme Court, it is. That is where you go to resolve all of the maritime disputes. I see, I see. Okay. The fourth question. If two countries have a dispute, uh, were um, the international tribunal for the law of the sea, or is it an, an international course of justice, where do they go? Okay, well, if two countries have a dispute, yeah. they can either go so, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, what they do at ITLOS, as it's also called, right. it is in Hamburg, Germany, mm -hmm. and what they do there is they will adjudicate the matter, they will hear it, based off of UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Right. That convention gave birth to ITLOS. It said that there must be a tribunal that can resolve maritime disputes when countries have a problem. Oh. So that's where they go. As it relates, however, to the International Court of Justice, right. not every country has signed on to the United Nations Convention of the Sea, right. UNCLOS. So those who have not signed on may want to go to a different court and they can choose the International Court of Justice. Okay, so I have a question. You said prior to that, that Supreme Court 
is um, where Jamaica goes. It's a case where if you're not happy with the results, is it not going to be your favor? You can take the results and then go to it's an international tribunal of law or the international court of justice. The, okay, so what it would be at that point is when two countries are having a problem. Mm -hmm. So when the two countries, remember we spoke about private, mm -hmm. maritime and public? Yeah. This is to do with two countries. So two countries would go to the International Tribunal for the Law of okay, okay. It would be individuals who would go to the Supreme Court of Jamaica. Right. So you would see the countries going to Germany, where they can have it resolved at it loss, right, or right. to the International Court of Justice, which is in the Hague, which is in Hamburg. So you go over to there, in the Hamburg, sorry, Hamburg, Germany. I see. To have okay. it resolved. I have, I have, I have yes. Thank you for that. Okay, so it says Jamaica relies on the English common law as a proof appointed to civil law by the US. What does that really mean? Okay, so we use the English common law right. as opposed to the civil law that is used like in the United States okay. and some other South American countries. Right. What the English common law states is the principle of stare decisis. That is, previous decisions is what the judges are bound by. Mm. So they will follow previous decisions. And that is how they're bound. However, in the civil law, they have what they call codes. And these codes now speak to what is to be done in every situation. Okay. We don't have the codes. What we have is a more flexible way that lawyers can argue their cases and have it in a much more flexible manner. Okay. So to ask Paul for my question, do you think that um, what we have in our system works best off all matters, or is the case where you think we should adopt US based? What we have is a very good system. Okay. I will not put down another model because each has its advantages and disadvantages. Right, we use the English common law and it has worked very well for our society. Okay. And I don't see us ever departing from the English okay. common law. That is the next you know. It's the history. Yeah, well, of yes. course. Of course. Okay, so the sixth question. Sorry, why is Maritime Act? My my bad. Why is the Maritime Areas Act so important? Okay, the Maritime Areas Act is extremely important. Mm -hmm. You have to know this for your exam. Oh, okay. The Maritime Areas Act, if you don't remember any other act, remember the Maritime Areas Act. Right. And that act speaks, it is the local version of UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Okay. Everything that was embodied in that international convention right. is now embodied in domestic law. So what is international law is also local law. Okay. So when you breach certain breaches, they will be followed. So as you, as the semester goes on and you learn more, you will realize. But do not forget the maritime area. So, so following that, I just just want to clarify: Is it the Maritime Act affects everybody who is a seafarer, or is it just for um, ships, or how does it work? I just the Maritime Area Act speaks to the sea, to so the territorial portions of the sea. So, so remember we spoke, remember when we learned, we learned of different zones, the maritime, the right. zones. So we learned of the territorial sea, the EEZ, yeah. the, all of those parts, the Maritime Areas Act speaks of how it is to be governed. Hmm. So it speaks of how people are to be governed in it, how okay. ships are to be governed, everything what is expected of anybody who is interacting with the ocean. Right, and just to clarify, is it within our nautical miles or is it just outside of the It speaks directly, this, the maritime area that speaks to our, no. um, or within our 200 nautical oh, miles. Okay, okay. So it That's speaks to our zone. Good to know. Yes. Okay. Is there somewhere, so if, if um, someone who's outside of our nautical miles, so you have people who work on ships and they go from different countries to different countries, is there somewhere else they can go to to protect themselves? Where there, they... Yes, there are various legislations yeah. that protect them. Primary one being the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Okay. Wow. is the overarching yeah. one. But there are other ones you will learn as the semester goes on. Right. You will learn about all of those others. Okay. But the one I do not want to forget is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Okay. That is the most important. And for us here in Jamaica, right. the Maritime Areas Act. Those are the two most important legislations I want you to remember right now. Okay, awesome. And last but not least, where can I find cases? To oh, just to okay. kind of help me grow as a person to understand it better in my own time. Well, exactly, because the cases are what you need to know. So, exactly the same place I'm actually heading to right now, right. the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has an excellent website 
all their websites, the Supreme Court on Jamaica website. Okay. Excellent. It has a section called Cases. Mm -hmm. And you type in the search engine, just type in Admiralty Law. Because oh. remember, Admiralty is a private area. So I type in Admiralty Law, and that brings you all of the maritime law cases so far that have been adjudicated in Jamaica. So you have no excuse to tell yeah. me that you don't know any other cases. I couldn't find everything is on the, the, the Supreme Court of Jamaica website. Okay, great. That really helps us because we're such a global country and we want to be able to access these and learn a little bit better. Exactly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sweet. You're welcome. I'm heading off now. You, you study up yes. and do very well on my exam. Bye. Bye.